Well, hello and uh, welcome to this new review of another philosophical text. Um, this time we're doing a short essay, very short actually, it's just, uh, it's less than five pages long, but um, it's a very important essay and it's also one of the texts that I recommend to anyone who wants to start reading philosophy. Like sometimes people ask me what book or text uh, they should start with when, you know, engaging for the first time uh, with the philosophy. I often recommend introductions uh, instead of, you know, heading on with uh, the key texts, like, uh, for example, um, Simon uh, Blackburn's book, Think, is an excellent uh, introduction for beginners. You can also have Thomas uh, Nigel, uh, What Does It All Mean? It's also a good read if, you, uh, if you're looking for a book uh, to, start, uh, to start with. Um, Bertrand Russell, also uh, The Problems of Philosophy, will provide you with a good summary of many of the concepts we use in philosophy. Um, but you, if you are into literature and find it easier to read something when you know there's a story, I know some people, uh, people like that, they cannot stand to read a book uh, about an argument or when you know the author just throws some weird concept at your face uh, with complicated sentence structures like philosophers are not really you know novelists or poets I mean some of them some of them are some philosophers write very beautifully but most philosophers I mean they're more concerned with you know treatises and essays and sometimes people can find that boring so if you're used to reading novels for example or poetry philosophical writing can seem sterile it can seem you know remote to you so uh, maybe you need when you read to be immersed in scenes and feel emotions you enjoy you know uh, figures of speech and you need to feel implicated with some characters or stuff like that um, some people are like that you know uh, for them if a book doesn't have a good writing style they won't read it and so if you're like that well I can recommend Sophie's World by uh, Gardner. Um, that would be great for you and I know many people got interested in philosophy through that book in particular. It's a novel about a girl named uh, Sophie who receives letters from an unknown professor in which, you know, he gives her the history of philosophy, like in each letter it's about a certain philosopher, his uh, ideas, and there's also a cool a cool story with a cool plot twist, so I think you will definitely enjoy that book. Um, but for today I decided to take on a very short text and I think it's one of the best introductions to uh, philosophy because you basically have in it exactly uh, what is required of you when uh, when you practice philosophy. You know, this is a text by the German philosopher Hegel and contrary to the usual style of Hegel, like Hegel is known for being a very bad writer, uh, very obscure, notoriously difficult to read and uh, and you know this text is actually you know pretty accessible when you compare it to uh, to his other uh, to his other uh, works so this the text is called who thinks abstractly and you can find it online at uh, marxist.org or you can find it in this book right here uh, Hegel texts and the commentary compiled translated and edited by Walter Kaufman um, it's uh, again it's a very short essay, uh, less than five pages. Uh, I mean, it's basically an article uh, and its origins are as obscure as Hegel's main uh, writing style. Uh, like, um, we're not sure when Hegel wrote it or even why. Uh, some have suggested that it's an article that he wrote for local newspapers during his, uh, during his uh, Berlin period, so between 1818 and uh, 1831, uh, so the, the year of his death. But others have argued that it is from his Jena period, which is more likely. So it was written between 1801 and 1807. So, um, so, so we don't we don't have much about the context in which he wrote this article, um, in, uh, and it's not and it's not even that famous. Uh, like I don't know many philosophers who mentioned uh, this text, but those who do uh, have pretty nice things to say about uh, this uh, this text. Particularly Martin Heidegger, um, for instance, he's one of the most important philosophers of the 20th century, and he uh, presented. This, uh, this text as the best introduction to philosophy, uh, to the philosophy of German idealism and to philosophy in general with regard to its procedure of, uh, of thought. That's from uh, Heidegger's book uh, Schelling's Treatise on the Essence of Human uh, Freedom. We will go back to, uh, to this book. Now, 
uh, clearly we have to explain a few things, you know, I mean, we have to explain what is German idealism because I think, well, I mean, there is there is no uh, introduction to this uh, to this text, so we kind of have to to make one uh, to make one here. And so I think you know, uh, knowing what is German idealism, because uh, Hegel's text, well, it it is it is part of this movement uh, called German idealism. So we have to know what uh, what there is. Um, but we also have to address another thing uh, in uh, in the quote give, uh, I just gave you by by Heidegger, uh, which is you know that that second part when where he says. Uh, it's the best introduction to uh, to philosophy with regard to its procedure of uh, of thought okay so he states that the text is the best introduction to philosophy because its procedure of uh, of thought and i think we should start with uh, with that so what does that mean well it means that the way the text is arguing is a great example for anyone who see who wants to see how uh, a philosopher thinks, okay? Uh, like what is the procedure that thinking takes in order uh, to be philosophical, right? So thought is a process and depending on the process of your thought will determine uh, its quality and will determine if it's, uh, if it's philosophical or not. So here we're not interested in, um, in the content of the thought, uh, but rather uh, we're concerned with the procedure of, uh, of that thought, okay? A thought has content, of course, but we're more interested, uh, you know, in how you reach that content or how that content was, uh, was formed. So a philosopher always wants the content of his thoughts to be difficult to refute uh, on reasonable grounds because the process he went through to reach that content is well solid. Uh, it doesn't omit uh, relevant facts, it uh, minimizes fallacies, it has to be coherent, etc. So basically you need your thought to be concrete and that's what Hegel is trying to show us with, uh, with this text. Okay, How to have the right procedure of thought to be called a philosopher, uh, you need to think concretely in order to be a philosopher and and that can be, uh, can seem a little bit weird you know because the title uh, of the text is who thinks abstractly uh, and hegel is basically saying that you have to think concretely and the opposite of a concrete thought it's an abstract thought now i know some people you know when um, like when i gave this this text uh, during uh, workshops for example um the the participants they were they were kind of they were kind of baffled by this because um, they thought that you know uh, to think abstractly is what philosophers uh, is what philosophers do okay um, because uh, because they think that you know philosophers think abstractly because philosophers always deal with abstractions you know and we often take the ability to think with abstract concepts as a you know signs uh, as a sign of intelligence because uh, because abstractions aren't uh, aren't uh, aren't objects that you can uh, touch or see. They're not material. You cannot manipulate uh, manipulate them like you would, you know, manipulate uh, manipulate clay, for example, or uh, or wood. You know, I mean, uh, uh, abstractions are, are like mental uh, representations um, or entities that have. Um, I mean, that you have to interact with without being able to see or touch them directly. You know, an example of this is mathematical or ph uh, or physical equations. Uh, you can't uh, you can't really see uh, e equals mc square. Uh, I mean, you can see the symbols by writing. You know, the the, the equation on the board, but the equation itself well you don't you don't see it and yet it is something that is governing uh, most of our physical uh, reality so it would require a lot of intellectual gymnastics to be able to grasp nature for example through equations uh, through a disembodied representation of the natural world um, so to say that you know Einstein's equation is about energy feels kind of weird because well we don't see any energy uh, in, uh, in E equals MC square, right? Um, like equations are not visible, you know, and you don't even see the process of, uh, you know, of how energy is, uh, is, uh, is created, which, you know, the equation is supposed to be capturing that. Um, so these equations, when you don't see them, you only, uh, you only deduce them uh, through, you know, experimentation, observation, uh, rational thinking, and all, uh, and all of that. And so, as I am experimenting with the physical world, you know, at one point I won't 
need to be you know really experimenting it with my you know with my with my senses uh, like at some point you know uh, there is just a limit to what my senses can reveal to me about uh, about the world like you know i can um, like I can only experiment a word just to test, uh, to test a, hypo a hypothesis to see if the equation is correct because I can, you know, I'm going to predict some, um, I'm going to use the equation to predict some phenomena and if my senses can see that phenomena, well, then I, I conclude that my equation is, uh, my equation is accurate. Right, but um, but yeah, but to understand that word, I cannot just rely on my senses. So I need to uh, to go beyond, you know, experimenting in that uh, in that sense. Um, and so you know, I reach a point where I am basically understanding the world through uh, a bunch of equations, through a bunch of abstractions. So. Um, so, so yeah, so that's basically an abstraction. You see the world, uh, you, you are looking at the world, and in order to understand it, to better understand it, you need to compress or reduce it into abstractions that make it easier uh, for you to understand that word, to interact with it, uh, with it. So you can think of an abstraction like, you know, a device that compresses a lot of things uh, within a small entity that you can carry around with you. It's kind of like, you know, those capsules in, uh, in Dragon Ball that compress uh, houses, uh, planes or cars, even time machines uh, into tiny capsules and you can carry them in, uh, in your pocket. So we, uh, we may say, you know, that philosophers where they are doing basically the same thing as, uh, as physicists with equations, but we do it with concepts. Um, whether it is, you know, specific concepts like, you know, Plato's theory of the forms, uh, Descartes' uh, cogito, Spinoza's conatus, uh, Leibniz's monad, uh, Kant's noumena, Heidegger's dasein, uh, Sartre's bad faith, or Deleuze's body without organ, uh, or Timothy Morton's hyperobjects, which I covered in a few uh, videos were just right here. Uh, or you, we can talk about more general concepts like, for example, quiddity or hexaity or ipsaity. Uh, all of these concepts, well, they are abstractions that grasp reality so that we can understand it better and without having to be engaged constantly with, uh, with, re with reality in every single aspect of, its, uh, of, of, that, of that reality. And of course, don't worry. You don't need to know all of those concepts that I just uh, that I just listed. Um, uh, I mean, for our purposes here, that's not that's not really necessary. Uh, you just need to know that those basically work in the same way as mathematical formulas or physical equations when it comes to dealing with the word. You know, like we just make abstractions, we reduce the word to just a few um, uh, to just a few co concepts, and you know, those concepts where they kind of encapsulate. Uh, what is you know, what is um, what is needed you know to be uh, um, uh, to be uh, <clears throat> to be kept in mind when we uh, think about the world. Um, so, does this mean that you have to uh, to know a lot of abstractions in order to be a philosopher? Well, the answer is no, because when we already uh, know a lot of abstractions like we use abstractions basically all the time in our life it doesn't it doesn't, doesn't take uh, doesn't take you to be a philosopher or a physicist or a math mathematician to be uh, you know working with abstractions uh, our language for example language is a bunch of abstractions each one of our words is an abstraction which is essential for communication like when I say the word tree, for example, I turn the tree into an abstraction so I can carry it and carry it with me. Uh, when I talk to someone about trees, for example, like uh, imagine if I am um, in a biology class and I'm, you know, the, the teacher, um, uh, you know, I'm the teacher and I have to explain to my students what trees are or how they reproduce. I'm not going to bring a tree into the classroom and point to whatever it is, uh, to whatever it is I, I need to point to so that they would understand what, you know, what, what I'm talking about. Um, but with the word tree, well, me and the students, well, we can understand, we can conceptualize and even visualize what I'm talking about. And likewise, the word tree is a compression of all kinds of trees, you know, I mean, if I have to invent a word uh, for every single tree, and not just species of trees, but 
every individual tree because there is no two identical trees of course well there won't be any end to uh, to words and we wouldn't even be uh, we wouldn't even be uh, you know understanding each other so instead the word tree compresses into it you know palm trees oak trees maple trees laurel trees apple trees like all of them all of them are are trees so so that's pretty uh, pretty convenient actually it's pretty convenient because uh, if we have to take into account every you know um, sp uh, specificity of every uh, of every uh, of everything you know I mean we wouldn't uh, we wouldn't be able to to communicate so when we use words we are already uh, ab do doing an abstraction because we are you know reducing or removing some things that we consider as you know maybe irrelevant let's say to uh, uh, to our purposes of communication like uh, the, the philosopher the English philosopher John Locke already already you know um, wrote about this uh, he had he basically had this in mind when he wrote uh, and I quote words are used to uh, stand as outward marks of our internal ideas which are taken from particular things but if every particular idea that we take in had its own special name, there would be no end to names. To prevent this, the mind makes particular ideas received from particular things become general, which it does by considering them as they are in the mind, mental appearances, separate from all other uh, existences and from the circumstances of real existence, such as time, place, and so on. This procedure is called abstraction. In it, an idea taken from a particular thing becomes a general representative of all of the same kind, and its name becomes a general name that is applicable to any existing thing that fits that abstract idea. So that's taken from his essay concerning human understanding. And so basically, you know, that's a neat definition of an abstraction. You know, I mean, you reduce uh, something into one into one concept like it can be uh, like 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 a word for example and and that word well kind of uh, kind of overlooks uh, it kind of overlooks the uh, uh, you know like the circumstances the time place the context of that uh, uh, of the thing that you were reducing to an uh, an abstraction and you know that makes it easier uh, it makes you more pr uh, practical for communication so already no you don't need to be uh, you, you don't need uh, you, like being a philosopher isn't just a, isn't just limited to dealing with uh, with abstra uh, with abstractions um, now people can say that you know a philosopher deals with complex abstractions that requires a lot of training skill and knowledge to grasp and use that can be true. Philosophers often deal with complex uh, abstractions instead of simple ones that we use in our everyday life, like you know our uh, our languages, and uh, have uh, and have more pragmatic purposes than you know philosophical abstractions. Um, but that doesn't make you a philosopher. That's not enough. Um, that you know what quiddity is, for example, or what is the body without organs, doesn't make you a philosopher because, as we said, philosophy isn't about the content of your thought. Having complex abstractions that, uh, in, in your mind, that's great, but that's just the content, it's not the procedure. Sure, I mean, some disciplines uh, can maybe be satisfied with just the content, like I think if in, in physics, for example, if you know your equations, then I think you, you would qualify technically uh, to be called a, a physicist, but in philosophy, uh, it's often a whole different story. Like what matters is what you do with your abstractions. How do you think about them? Uh, so we are more concerned with the process in which you apply or uh, or by which you reach those uh, those concepts. So you can still uh, think in an unphilosophical way. Uh, or a non-philosophical way about philosophical abstractions. And that is what makes your thinking abstract instead of concrete. So when Hegel talks about uh, abstract thinking, he doesn't have in mind the content of your thoughts, but the way you think. And so the question is to know how to distinguish between uh, an abstract thought and a concrete thought. And so this is where German idealism comes in because, well, the, the German idealists like Immanuel Kant, uh, Fichte, Schelling, Holderling, and Hegel were obsessed 
with this uh, with this issue, and um, and this is where we we turn we turn to them because uh, what they what they were trying to do is to distinguish between you know the abstract thought and the concrete thought, and so we can um, we can just use Heidegger's book, uh, the one that I uh, that I mentioned earlier, from which I get the quote uh, about uh, about Hegel's uh, text. Uh, we can use that book to understand, you know, what is uh, German uh, idea, German idealism, um, because well, uh, the book that uh, that Heidegger that Heidegger was uh, that, that, that Heidegger wrote um, is actually a review. I think it was it was some lectures. Uh, it was some lectures that he uh, that he gave. I, I I forgot I forgot when. Um, but it was uh, about a book by uh, another German idealist, uh, Friedrich uh, Schiele, Schelling, and uh, about his treatise on the essence of human freedom, to be more precise. So we need to say a few words about uh, about uh, about about that about that book uh, because uh, Schelling was a very important influence on Hegel um, we can say you know that uh, we, we can even say that you know uh, Hegel's text who thinks abstractly is basically uh, Schelling's thought put in practice you know who thinks abstractly is, she is basically Schelling's German idealism applied to everyday life so um, Hegel um, if we Again, if we put his "Who Thinks Abstractly" uh, at uh, 1807, means that he wrote that text while being the roommate of uh, of Schelling, and uh, Schelling published his treatise like two years uh, two years later. So these two had uh, were very were very close together, and we can and we can say you know like uh, the relationship between these two texts between uh, Schelling's treatise and uh, Hegel's uh, short article. We can say you know that one provides the theory, while the other one provides the uh, the, 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 um, the practice. Um, so, in that treatise, uh, Schelling was trying to defend the notion of human freedom against the rising the rising determinism of the 18th century that resulted from the 17th century influence uh, of uh, Baruch, uh, Baruch Spinoza. So Spinoza uh, argued that everything was God, that nature and God are basically the same thing. Uh, we call that view pantheism, literally meaning everything is God, uh, from you know the Greek word pan, which means everything, and theus, which means God. So everything is God, that's what pantheism means. And so because of that, Spinoza argues that everything is determined, that all events are bound to happen in the way that they happen, because they are the effect of some cause, and they will be the cause of future effects, and the effect and the cause, well, they must be appropriate to each, uh, to each other. Like, there has to be a logical link between the cause and, uh, the, uh, and the effect. Like, a fire is bound to produce smoke, right? Like, if I lit a fire and water comes, uh, comes out of the flame, that would... Uh, that would, uh, you know, that would be absurd, and therefore it would be impossible, you know. So, whenever I light a fire, well, it's going to produce smoke. It's not going to produce water. So this relies on the notion that there has to be a logic that the causes and effects follow. Otherwise, we'll have, you know, stuff popping in and out of existence randomly. And God is basically what holds those things together. It's the logical chain between causes and effects. And so this view often leads. Uh, this is the problem. It, that it often leads to uh, to uh, to deny free will because we often take free uh, we often take free will as meaning that it is something that is auto uh, auto determined. Like I have free will because I can determine myself. I am the cause of my own actions, and since I am what I do, uh, I then am my own cause. So we often understand free will as choice, like I choose to eat a sandwich instead of a pizza because I wanted a sandwich, uh, not because there is a current of causes, you know, a chain of causality in which I was bound to want the sandwich and choose the sandwich, but I would say because, well, I just wanted the sandwich, you know, my action uh, has no other cause than myself. But then this, uh, this raises a problem, which is, well, we seem to be in a world in which everything that exists has a cause, right? I mean, there is no uncaused cause, there is no uncaused things. Well, 
Well, I mean, technically, I mean, you, you can have uncaused causes, but, you know, that's, um, that's, way more, that's way too complicated for our purposes here. And besides, this is the 18th century, so we're kind of doing with what we have. Uh, so we're just going to say that there are no uncaused uh, causes. Um, so, yeah, so we look at the world, everything that exists in this world has a cause, uh, but then free will also exists, so it's also a thing, it's part of everything that exists, but if free will exists, then it has a cause, and if it has a cause, well, free will cannot be something else than what the cause uh, makes it to be, you know, or forces it to be. Uh, so whatever causes my free will obliges my free will to be free will, like, you know, the, the fire obliges the smoke to be smoke. And so the smoke cannot be anything else, so if free will cannot be anything else, then my free will isn't really free, right? And it is also caused by something else. So in this sense, I am not free in two ways. I mean, I'm not free because something else is determining me, uh, so I'm not auto-determined. And the second way is that you cannot be anything else but whatever, uh, but what, whatever, what, uh, but whatever, uh, but whatever your cause determines you to be, right? Um, so that's basically the idea of determinism, but in a very narrow uh, nutshell. Um, in Spinoza's determinism, there is no free will. Well, actually, there is freedom, but it's a very different kind of freedom than the one we uh, we often think of when we say that we have free will. But I will examine that in uh, in a future series of videos dealing with uh, Spinoza. Uh, for now, that's the that's the idea. Pantheism leads to determinism, or in Schelling's more precise phrase, it leads to fatalism. Um, so, so you know, I mean, determinism and fatalism are not really the same thing, like fatalism is like a hardcore determinism in which everything is already decided upon uh, and there is no escape from this current of causality. So Schelling therefore criticizes uh, Spinoza on those grounds, like he accepts pantheism but he rejects fatalism. And as Heidegger says in his book on Schelling, by, uh, by an anticipatory uh, reflection, Schelling unsettles the interpretation of panthe pantheism as fatalism current in his time. He tries to show that pantheism so little necessarily leads to the denial of freedom, that on the contrary, the primordial experience of freedom requires pantheism. So, basically, Sch Schelling is accepting that, you know, everything is one substance, like everything is God, but he wants to make room for free will. And so, um, what came to be known as the German idealist is the trend in German philosophers, starting with Kant, to solve this problem between determinism and free will by trying to come up with a synthesis between, uh, between these two. So I already, I already mentioned idealism in previous videos, uh, like uh, in, uh, uh, in my videos on uh, Murray Bookchin's uh, review of uh, social or lifestyle anarchism, and I argue that revolutionary thinkers usually reject idealism, seeing it as an individualistic and uh, bourgeois philosophy that forgets about the material conditions of consciousness and existence, like in the attempt of, you know, to in, the, in their attempt to save uh, free will, idealists run the risk of making everything, well, just ideas, you know, uh, everything is just the content of people's mind, and if you are uh, miserable at your work, it's not the job or the uh, material conditions in which you are living in, it's not that your boss is an asshole, it's just, it's just your ideas, okay? So change your ideas and you'll feel better, uh, and, you know, like, this is often the political consequence of idealism. Um, if you want a book that can also be a good uh, introduction to philosophy from a Marxist point of view, um, that tackles uh, this problem of idealism, uh, you can check uh, Georges Politzer's uh, Principe de Philosophie Elementaire, or in English, Elementary Principles of Philosophy. Um, for our purposes here, we'll just say that German idealism is the attempt 
uh, of reaching a synthesis between determinism and free will. Um, we also don't need to explain what, uh, what is meant by the word idea here uh, in metaphysics uh, or what the absolute is in German idealism for us to understand the, the text of, uh, of Hegel. Uh, although those are critical concepts in German idealism, so if you can familiarize, familiarize yourself with those concepts, reading the text, uh, read, reading Hegel's text is going to be um, is going to feel so much rewarding. Um, but for our purposes here, we don't we don't need to know uh, what those uh, what those are. There is, however, another aspect we need to talk about, uh, which is central. Uh, it, it is a central theme in German idealism and in Schelling, uh, Schelling's treatise, and it will also be uh, helpful to us when we uh, when we start reading who thinks abstractly, and that that aspect is what we call in philosophy the problem of evil. So. German idealists were basically looking at philosophy and saw that it was really struggling to explain evil. Uh, like where does evil come from and how can it fit within a philosophical system, especially a, uh, a system like, you know, pantheism, which for the German idealist is clearly the one that makes the most sense because other models uh, that are not pantheistic would have to make a separation between God on the one hand and everything else on the other. And if you do that, you'd be confronted with a what we call a dualist vision, like you, you'd be looking at the word, uh, uh, we, call, we call this dualism, it's when you, uh, when you say that there are two substances of the world and these two are somehow interacting with each other while being ontologically uh, radically different. And so this leads to a, to a multitude of paradoxes that the German idealists saw as impossible to overcome because in reality, everything is just one substance and that substance is God. But then the problem of evil remains. Now in a dualistic account where God and the universe are separate, uh, when we can explain evil by placing it within the universe and not within, uh, within God. Like we can say that evil is caused by human beings and human beings are separate from, uh, from God. But that makes us wonder why God, since he is, you know, absolutely good, you know, he is 100% uh, benevolent and uh, since he obviously can have an, impa an impact on the universe because he is all powerful and he's also all knowing, why doesn't he get rid of evil? So that would contradict his essential uh, essential features and we call this the uh, the Epicurean paradox because Epicurus uh, the philosopher Epicurus was the one who thought uh, who brought this uh, this paradox like if God is uh, <clears throat> like if God is all powerful all knowing and benevolent and benevolent why is he then allowing evil to uh, to exist and so, in the pantheistic model, however, we have a monist model, you know, there's just one substance, God and universe aren't, you know, separate, but then that would mean that evil is also a feature of God, and that would ob obviously contradict God's essence too, you know, and it will also, uh, and also, you know, uh, be a problem regarding our freedom. So remember that Schelling's essay is about human freedom and he's going to be arguing that you cannot have freedom in a system that throws away the possibility of, of evil. Like in, you know, simplistic determinism, for example, if everything is determined, uh, then the concept of evil doesn't make sense anymore uh, because every every act will be determined by other acts and if you want evil then you need to uh, you need you need acts that are committed by free will so without free will there is no evil and without evil there would be no free will and so the reality is well evil exists you know so freedom has to exist as well and so the problem is how we are going to reconcile that with pantheism and so heidegger tell, uh, tells us that there are three ways to look at that problem one you can look at it through uh, imminence being contained through co <coughs> concourses uh, or accompaniment and three through a system of emanation the flowing of things from god now what 
what does all of this mean? Well, as for the first one, well, we've already explained it. It's when you say that evil is also, you know, posited in God, that uh, evil is contained within God, which then leads us to say that evil is being contained within God, and that would be impossible because it would contradict his benevolent uh, attribute. So the second way means that we look at evil as a supplement, you know, it is an, uh, an accompaniment, something added to the system like a parasite. But then the problem arises again, where does that parasite come from? And if so, you'll have to explain, uh, you'll have to explain, you know, why God is allowing it. To be uh, to be there in uh, in the first place, and so you're going to end up with a dualistic uh, vision of of the world. And um, as Heidegger says, both of these systems, that of immanence and that of uh, concursus, are so uh, are so posited that all positive being is understood as coming from God. But if evil is something positive, then these systems negate themselves, since God is always thought uh, as the ens perfectissimum, so the the most uh, the thing that is you know perfect by excellence, as the highest being excluding every lack. And as for the third option, uh, it says that evil is just a matter of how far we are from God. Like we are still within God, but it's like, you know, you are near the border instead of, you know, being close to, uh, to the center. But this view also has a problem because, as Heidegger says, in the system of things flowing from God, the system of uh, emanation, the difficulty of unifying evil with God is not removed, it is just postponed. Like the problem of evil is solved for those who are far from God, but as you move up on this, you know, spectrum towards the, the divine center or whatever, the problem of evil, well, it's going to rise again. So you're just postponing the problem, like, yeah, we'll, we'll deal with it when we get close to God. Like. And so none of these models reflect, you know, the true meaning of human freedom, uh, which for Schelling is freedom is freedom for good and evil. So as long as we are human, we cannot conceive of any kind of freedom, no matter how close we're trying to, uh, we're trying to, you know, uh, we're trying to, to get close to, to God, you know, that would make evil a supplement, something added or something that is accidental within the system, we need to look at evil as something substantial within, uh, within freedom. So freedom must always be understood as the capacity for both good and evil, period. And for the German idealists, well, they also need a system that explains evil as existing together or belonging with God. And so Heidegger and Schelling therefore frame the problem differently. The reason why evil is so problematic is because we are taking it as non-existent, as a negative, as a lack in being. So since being is what exists and what exists can be apprehended by thought, whatever cannot be uh, apprehended by thought, well, cannot exist. So evil is something that we cannot explain, therefore evil is often seen as something that doesn't belong to the realm of existence. You know, this is where Heidegger offers a different take on this issue, which is to say that although lack is an absence, we can say that lack is a being non-present. And so like non-presence becomes a mode of being, a way for being to be, you know, uh, to be a non-being. <laughs> uh, like this is, like you can understand this uh, with the exam example of blindness. Like blindness is the absence of sight, but blindness, despite being a lack, it is something real. Like it is something that is positive. Now, not, not positive in the sense that it is good, but positive in the sense that it is present in reality. He says, the blind man who has lost his sight will argue vigorously against the statement that blindness is nothing existent and nothing depressing and nothing burd burdensome. Thus, nothingness is not negatory. So the German idealists don't see evil as a lack, but as a positive lack that is uh, an existent being that exists but in the mode of lack. So this means that in order to be good, uh, to be benevolent, 
the godness of God must be also the ground for the possibility of that mode of existence. You know, God has also to be the ground for that possibility of being, which is, you know, the possibility of lack. And in this case, you know, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be evil. You know, the goodness of God is also has to be the ground of evil, as well as all the other modes of existence. So. To be the ground of beings, as we shall see, does it mean that, you know, the beings must be and remain dependent uh, of you, but rather you are the very own condition of their independence. So for evil to exist, a certain independence must exist between that evil, you know, that evil and its ground, okay? Um, since, you know, the ground is goodness, you know, because the ground is God, and evil is in opposition to that, then beings must be independent from their, from their ground, as Heidegger writes. But if freedom as the, capa uh, the capability of evil must have a root independent of God, and if God, on the other hand, is to remain the one and sole root of beings, then this ground of evil independent of God can only be in God. There must be in God something which God himself is not. God must be conceived more primordially. And so this concept of God, you know, more primordially uh, as God, uh, you know, as, as God, uh, God as the ground of all things, and likewise things can be the grounds for other things, you know, like human beings are grounded in their freedom which mean uh, which means they uh, which means that it includes all possible ways for human beings to exist you know all of their possibilities as modes of their beings like human beings can can exist as happy they can exist as sad they can exist as joyful as eccentric as conservative as men as women as trans as alive but also as dead and so the fact that we die for example means that we can also exist as, well, non-humans or as non-present humans. Our own humanity grounds, you know, those possibilities, including the possibility of our impossibility. It is therefore logical to assume the same thing about evil, that, you know, our freedom has to ground the most radical uh, aspect of its manifestation, which is, you know, evil, in the same way as, you know, our humanity has also to ground in itself, well, the possibility of not existing anymore, and, you know, that is, that is what we would call death. So, same thing here, quote, the nature of human freedom is conceived as the faculty of good and of evil. Evil is a way of man's being free. Now, this may come to us as trivial because, well, we know that evil exists, right? Uh, like we see it every day. Most of us aren't really panthe uh, pantheist in the Spinoza sense because no one thinks that, you know, evil is a lack. You know, it's something that does, uh, that does exist. But knowing that evil exists isn't really the problem. The problem is that we treat evil as a lack. Okay, so it doesn't mean that we are indifferent to it, but that um, we cannot explain it. You know, we cannot explain its presence. Uh, like when you explain someone, uh, someone, someone's actions as evil, your explanation will probably be, well, he's evil. <laughs> you know, uh, why is someone, someone doing mean things? Well, because he's mean. That's it. Um, so we don't. Um, we often don't seem to be able to explain evil through other means than itself without running the risk of, you know, turning the evil into something either uh, either good or, you know, a neutral act. You know, when you try to explain why someone did something evil uh, by appealing to, you know, his, uh, his education or, uh, uh, or his past or stuff like that, you know, I mean, you run the risk of turning the evil act into something that is neutral. Um, and so what Schelling is trying to do is to be able to explain evil and to engage with it, uh, to see it as something uh, essential to our being and our world, but without denying its nature as evil. 
So we, on the other hand, always want to deny evil. We, um, when we point to it, is just to make it go away. You know, like like it's an unwelcomed stranger. You know, strangers, outsiders, uh, the unwanted are often accused of being evil, like they don't belong here with us. So even if we know that evil exists, doesn't mean that we treat it as a positive being, but we we often treat it as a negative lack. So the reason why we need to consider evil here is because when we'll talk about when we'll talk about Hegel's, uh, Hegel's text, we'll see that he gives examples of abstract thinking in the context of evil. But for now, uh, for now, I mean, we're, we're just going to stick to this idea so far. Like, if you want freedom, you need evil, and that freedom is incompatible with God. If we take the pantheistic God, uh, uh, sorry, is compatible. Uh, freedom is compatible with God if we take pantheism, uh, the pantheistic God, as ground for beings. So we don't need we don't need a further explanation about evil or how Schelling gives his argument in details. Um, maybe I'll maybe maybe I'll do that uh, one day uh, if I cover Schelling's uh, treatise. Uh, what we need for now is to understand that German idealists are trying to overcome these difficulties that seem for many to be uh, to be aporias uh, which means unsolvable puzzles and more specifically they're concerned with um, the limits and obstacles we have when trying to overcome you know difficulties uh, difficulties like uh, like these and so the reason uh, why people struggle so much uh, between you know determinism and free will is because according to Schelling their thinking is superfluous um, like they have some limits in their thought that can't uh, that they cannot seem to uh, to overcome uh, and in order to understand those limits we need to look back at you know um, at the phrase of pantheism God is everything and more specifically to the is, okay, to uh, the verb to be. Because for the German idealist, the verb to be is significant, but we don't pay enough attention attention to it. Like for them, when I say uh, X is Y, the is plays, a, uh, plays the role of identification. You know, that X is Y means that Y is X, that Y belongs to X. Huh? The, the, the predicate is identical to the subject. So in other words, Y uh, cannot be different from X because then we'll have to say that X is not X, you know? Uh, and so the phrase X is Y means that X is not X, which is absurd, okay? A cat cannot be a not cat, right? A cat cannot be a dog. So for the German idealist, this is what breeds fatalism. Uh, the idea that you think that a thing is identical to itself in this manner, okay? So God is everything, equates everything with God, and therefore every single thing cannot be more than what it is, okay? So it is strictly deterministic, okay? It's it is Everything is strictly determined to the point of fatalism. But Schelling says that that's not, uh, that's not how we should understand that sentence, you know, everything is God. When we say X is Y, True, it is helpful in many practical ways to see things like that, but there is also another way, a higher understanding of the law of identity. And in this higher understanding, the subject and the predicate aren't identical to each other, okay? But rather, the subject is going to ground the predicate. Quote, in the is, we must think more of uh, and uh, something quite different from mere uh, identicalness, in which subject and predicate are thrown together, then appearing to be arbitrarily exchangeable. Subject is predicate means S grounds the possibility of being of P. Is the ground of P is the ground lying at the basis and thus prior. S is P means S grounds uh, grounds or gives P its ground. So here, instead of, you know, determining the predicate, the subject plays the role of offering the range of possibilities of being for the predicate, okay? It doesn't determine, it actually frees the predicate. So the phrase God is everything means that God is ground on which everything can exist as free 
beings. So therefore, the predicate has to be different from its subject. Its freedom lies in that it is others, um, that it is other than its uh, than its subject, its uh, than it is on, than its own ground. So the pantheism doesn't reject freedom, but serves as the ground for freedom as its condition. You know, freedom requires pantheism, as we said earlier. But the incapacity of seeing how the subject and the predicate are not just identical to each other, but one grounds the other in the sense that it allows its freedom, which means that the predicate can be and must be in opposition to its subject, uh, the incapability of you know, understanding this is what uh, the German idealists call superfluous thinking. As Heidegger says, superfluous thinking is distinguished by the fact that it thinks incompatible things next to each other without looking at them, sometimes appealing to one another, sometimes to the other, and opposition prevail. But neither of what is opposed is to be relinquished in favor of the other. Both are existent. So in other words, those limits make us see the problem through only one aspect at, uh, at a time. You know, it's either pantheism or free will. You cannot have them both. You know, this is superfluous thinking. And so Heidegger provides another example with, with science. We often hear that science has to be objective, right? As in, you know, it is independent of your subjectivity, your opinion, your interest, your desires, your ideology, etc. Science is neutral. And so in this case, Heidegger questions if indeed science is objective, can only, uh, can only be objective, or if this is stemming from an income, uh, incap from a limit, an obstacle, to see how science can also be subjective in the sense that it has a space for creativity and imagination. Quote, all science is objective, otherwise it would be... Uh, all science is objective, otherwise it would be subjective. I cannot think of a science other than objective, that is, either everything is objective or subjective. And that is all. But whether perhaps science is at the same time objective and at the same time subjective, that is, at bottom, neither uh, the one nor the other, that is neither asked nor even comprehended as the possibility of a question. So. So basically, he's saying that, you know, people often, I mean, they can think of science in just one way at a time. You know, science is either completely objective or completely uh, subjective. But, you know, to think of science as being both at the same time, uh, that, that, can be, that can be very challenging uh, for, for superfluous thinking, you know. And that space, you know, uh, that... Uh, uh, that space, you know, uh, in which you have uh, imagination and subjectivity in science isn't something that coexists with, you know, the neutrality of science, but that it is, but it is a, a feature of science itself, you know, like it's not a supplement, it's not something that ac accompanies science, you know, like we were talking uh, earlier about, you know, that, uh, about the idea that evil is just, you know, a supplement to, uh, to God. So that science is at the same time objective and subjective, like it's not, uh, it's not like it has two features and we can choose which one we will, uh, we will take, but rather uh, that we cannot have one without the other, you know, like you have to have them both simultaneously. And so for Heidegger, people who can see beyond this narrow kind of thinking, they lack what in philosophy is called the dialectics. You know, dialectical, uh, dialog dialogain means here to understand one thing in transition, uh, that's dia, through the other in its essential relation to the other, and not simply to have instant opinions. A dialectical proposition, for example, is the statement, the one is the other. For someone invested in dialectics, this sentence is uh, unversed, uh, sorry, for someone unversed in dialectics, this sentence is simply false and senseless. For him the only, uh, for him the one is precisely the one and the, one, and the other is the other. And so, in short, dialectics is a skill. You know, I mean, I consider it a skill that allows you to think in ways as to bring two, uh, two positions, two ideas that at first seemed 
unreconcilable with each other, but as you start developing them both, analyzing them, um, putting them you know, in front of each other, within the tension you will find that you know, something else is being created, a synthesis, between what we call the thesis and the antithesis that overcomes you know, the contradiction between those two uh, positions. So, for the German idealists, nothing is without this tension, without, you know, contradiction, uh, and so they bring this tension to the very essence of being of everything. Like, in other words, um, to understand the world, we have to admit that there is a tension uh, between being, and with a capital B, and beings. Like, uh, the being of the chair I am sitting, sitting on is in, is in tension with the chair. Right? So this means that everything, um, like within everything, let's say every unit of being, there has to be this tension. Okay? There is a tension between the being of the chair and the chair. So what makes the unity of something is therefore a tension that has to be overcome between the unity and its opposition. Now, to quote from Heidegger's book again, identity is the belonging together of what is different in one. Uh, still more generally expressed the unity of a unity and an opposition. So in common thinking, we don't like to think about the word in that way, or at least we can agree intellectually that things are in tension with, uh, with, uh, with each other or with being, uh, but then we'll go like, so what? <laughs> right? Like, why should we have to care about this? We can just, you know, take it as suggesting that the word is mysterious or magical in some ways uh, to give us some feeling of, encha of enchantment, maybe, uh, but it, it just stops right there, you know? We are either indifferent to that mystery of ontology or we, we just appeal to it when we want to justify some superstitious bullshit as we have, uh, we have as opinions, you know? Uh, things like, for example, uh, uh, the law of attraction, maybe, or uh, acupuncture, or some, you know, Eastern esoteric spirituality where we claim that there, that there are some cosmic tensions governing our world just to feel a sense of awe, you know. But concretely, it's not really something that will affect me in my life, uh, in my life, you know, beyond the, uh, the psychological benefits that I can get from it. And uh, if I think about it, it's just going to give me, you know, some, some headache. So, so let's just say, you know, that, yeah, okay, okay, things, things are the one and the other, but then, okay, it's, 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 it's cool, it's fine, uh, it has some, some spirituality behind it, but other than that, who cares? So, I can just say that, uh, I can just say that I know that a unity is the unity of a unity and of an oppos <laughs> opposition. I can say, you know, that the one is the other. It certainly sounds weird, but screw it. I'm, I'm going to keep living like I, oh, like I've always been, right? Or I can say, uh, you know, like, or I can say it in some sort of edgy, new age spiritual, uh, smarty pants, uh, Rick, uh, Rick and Morty fan, dipshit wannabe. But then again, I won't be grasping what it really means for the one to be the other. Uh, so the higher sense of identity is still unreached. And, uh, and so, if you, if you think like that, well, you would still be stuck in what German idealists call dialectical adolescence, you know? Like, dialectical maturity isn't an option for uh, superfluous thinking, you know? I mean, superfluous thinking at best stops at the adolescent, uh, adolescent phase of dialectics. So, maybe because if I have to apply that to my everyday life, uh, it would be it would be very difficult to uh, to function, right? Like if I if I have to use the higher understanding of identity in my practical life, you know, I mean that that would be very uh, very complicated for me, you know, to to communicate with people, to to do you know my everyday my everyday tasks. So instead of acting out uh, that the tension exists, common thinking would rather take things for identical because it's more pra pragmatic, you know? It's more practical for us to say that something is what it is rather than saying that something is what it is and what it is not, <laughs> right? Uh, I mean, you can think of that, of that meme, uh, the, the meme, it is what it is. Uh, it has a certain appeal because it makes things, it, it makes things seem obvious 
to us. You know, so obvious that even though that sentence is utter, uh, uttered in a fatal, uh, fatalistic way, like, you know, you get screwed or something and you just say it is what it is. And so it is so obvious that you, uh, it is so obvious that you got screw, uh, screwed that there is nothing much you can you can do, you know. And so in that fatality, uh, there is some sense of, of relief. You know, it's always a relief when things are what they are, but that doesn't tell us if, you know, they are like that in reality, you know. And we can ask ourselves, well, what is the consequence of that? Um, are there any undesirable effects when we omit the dialectical maturity uh, when we are thinking about, you know, uh, about our lives and some problems uh, in philosophy, but also in our lives. Well, Schelling and Hegel and Hegel think, uh, think there is. You know, the law of identity understood in its uh, fatalistic sense leads us to be completely passive, actually. We don't care anymore. No other possibilities for being come to our minds, but those that we are familiar with, you know. People simply take things as they are uh, in the sense of simply complying with the status quo. And so, despite the bad reputation that idealism got from, you know, the, the, the socialists like Marxists and communists, you can still find a lot of revolutionary potential in German idealism. I mean, Marx himself was an idealist in his younger years, and even when he matured into, you know, the, the writer of, of Das Kapital, he still was uh, using the methodology of, you know, the German idealists to promote the interests of the working class. So, the whole point of Marxism is to educate the working class so that the working class create new uh, classless societies, a society that is free from its fatalistic superstition. And so in this sense, Marxism is... Um, and so in this sense, Marxism is rooted in Schelling's uh, famous notorious quota. All rules for study are summed up in this one, learn only in order to create. So that's taken from his uh, 1803 lectures on uh, university studies, um, specifically from the third lecture. Um, it means um, it means that you know to um, it's meaning like to be is, is to be understood as progress towards others. Like like the act of creation is grounded in that sentence we say the one is the other. So creating means studying the world not just, you know, to paint a, mature, uh, a mental representation that corresponds to the world, but to imagine the possibilities that the world can take. You know, we need to transform our knowledge in ways that matter and not just, you know, to, to, to memorize things. You know, memorizing something is precisely the activity that reinforces uh, identity in the, in, the, in, the lower, in the lower sense, you know. Um, instead, you know, knowledge should uh, knowledge should serve transformative purposes. Like sure, Schelling uh, meant it on an individual level, but nothing prevents us uh, from using those principles as, you know, um, from using those principles on a social level as well. So using knowledge about the world means we ought to transform the world, as Marx uh, says. Um, we have to create new ways of thinking that are inclusive, in which one tends towards the other. We seek to create a world for the sake of, you know, allowing others and everyone the chance of being free, right? So to return to Heidegger, identity is truly not a dead relation of indifferent and sterile identicalness, but unity is directly productive, creative, and, pro uh, and progressing towards others. So that's the point of um, of German idealism, it is to uh, to take issue uh, to take the issue of identity, to release it from its inadequate and limited concept towards a cor correct and higher concept of identity. And so, to summarize, in Heidegger's term, we have um, Heidegger's terms. We have four things to keep in mind when I say S is P. When I say subject is predicate. The first one, the is uh, is understood as the identity of S and P, but the identity must be understood in a higher sense. The inadequate con concept of identity understands identity as mere uh, identicalness, 
and four, the correct concept of identity means the primordial belonging together of what is different in the one. And to pass from the inadequate to the correct concept of identity in which both the one and the other are included, uh, where the tension is overcome, well, for that we need dialectics, uh, we need mature dialectics. People need to be versed in dialectics in order to do that. Okay, quote, the thinking unversed in dialectics always thinks in one perspective only. The one that is the one and nothing more. So dialectics is the primary uh, tool of the philosopher, you know, so philosophy is basically the activity that leads you uh, from the one to the other. And so this is this is uh, where we get to Hegel's text, um, which, as we said, is apply is applied German uh, idealism. And what Hegel is calling abstract thinking is basically the superfluous the superfluous type of thinking that Heidegger was talking about. Um, abstract thinking and superfluous thinking, well, that's that's the same thing. Okay, they are identical. Um, they're they're opposed to what Hegel calls concrete thinking, and that's what philosophy is about. You know, in philosophy, you're supposed to be thinking, thinking concretely as opposed to abstractly. And so Heidegger sums it up perfectly in this following passage. This thinking, uh, abstract slash uh, superfluous, keeps to only one perspective. It is one-sided thinking which looks in a preoccupied way only in one direction, withdrawn and abstract. Thus, Hegel says, whomever thinks abstractly, one-sidedly, is, however, not a philosopher, but the common man. Only the philosopher thinks truly, concretely, that is, thinks, uh, thinks things in the, uh, in the unified conc uh, concrescence of their full nature, concretely. Common sense sees everything only under a single perspective, which it happens to fall prey to. It is incapable of even seeing the other side uh, or of thinking both sides together under a higher unity. Now, of course, you shouldn't think that philosophers are always succeeding in this. You know, like going beyond abstract thinking is extremely difficult and philosophers often criticize other philosophers for failing to transcend abstract uh, abstract thinking. Uh, I mean, hell, even even Hegel himself was accused of being abstract by other philosophers. You know, like the Danish uh, philosopher Soren uh, Kierkegaard, which Heidegger also covers in another book on German idealism, uh, and um, and it is called the Metaphysics of German Idealism, which is you know um, uh, another deep interpretation of uh, Schelling. He says. To think abstractly means for Kierkegaard to disregard the singular individual, this here and now, and to think only the universal, and thus also to disregard the, uh, the attempt to think the individual together with the universal. So he basically believes that philosophers can forget about uh, individual uh, singularity to focus on uh, to focus uh, on you know universal ideals instead instead of thinking about you know these two things simultaneously i mean that's uh, that's basically uh, kierkegaard's critique of hegel um, he he blames hegel for uh, for doing just that for that, that that he only apprehends the world in one side you know that of the universal at the expense of um, of the of the individual you know in contrast uh, so this is from uh, this is uh, this from uh, Heidegger's text. Uh, in contrast, Hegel thinks abstractly in Kierkegaard's sense for several reasons. One, because in Kierkegaard's, uh, Kierkegaard's uh, opinion, he forgets the thinking uh, individual and the individual in general and wishes to exist as the absolute himself. Two, because he mediates the difference between time and eternity, does not allow this infinite contradiction to persist, but sublates it by, in general, sublating the contradiction in everything, instead of recognizing the paradox that the uh, eternal has become a fact in the temporal. And three, the sublation of all contradictions and the apparent overlapping of the individual is connected to the essence of metaphysics as metaphysics of the unconditional subjectivity of, uh, of spirit. Okay, so it's it's a little bit complicated, but but it doesn't it doesn't really matter. Uh, if you want uh, if you want to get that in in details, you can you know still check uh, 
check the book. But the point is that even philosophers can get trapped in abstract thinking, and that's why we rely on other philosophers to criticize us, right? To reveal our flaws and weaknesses in our thinking. Now, you probably wonder about concrete thinking. Is it the same thing as critical thinking? And to some extent, yes. Uh, we can say that concrete thinking is also critical thinking, but that would be, uh, that would be left for the next video, uh, which is going to be the second part of the introduction to, uh, to Hegel's text, uh, which is going to be about uh, critical, uh, critical thinking. Now, I wasn't going to, to do a video on critical thinking, but given the circumstances and I thought about this, like maybe, maybe some people can ask me if concrete thinking is the same thing as critical thinking. So I thought, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do a video on critical thinking before going on to, uh, to Hegel's text. So thank you for watching and I'll see you next time for the next, uh, for the second video in this series on Hegel's Who Thinks Abstractly and uh